I want to start off this morning with a blatant attempt of name dropping in order to earn some form of credibility with you. Uh, and I'm just going to admit that up front, although I'm really sincere when I do this. I was in St. Louis last year uh, with a, a group of people trying to organize pastors in Missouri for last year's election. And I had heard about one of, these, one of the speakers that was there. Uh, he and I actually had been at other events, but I was speaking when he was speaking, so I never had a chance to hear him before. And so this time I said to my wife, I said, hey, um, whatever they're going to have me doing here to help organize these pastors, I'm going to stop. I'm going to have a seat. I want to hear this individual talk because I keep hearing a lot of great things about him. And I've interviewed him on my radio program, but I've never really heard him address an audience of his peers before. And it was the most powerful pro-life talk I have ever heard. And I've heard a ton of them. And I've just, I've never heard anything like it. It truly was prophetic. And I went out into the hallway. We are in a banquet room in downtown St. Louis. And I went out into the hallway and I just wanted to hear what some of the crowd reaction was to this talk. And um, my wife and I are just kind of lounging around and we're eavesdropping. And we hear a couple of guys with clearly very southern accents. And they're like, man, that was a great talk. I can't believe that came from a Lutheran. <laughs> we got the biggest kick out of that. And the man who gave that talk, his name is Dr. Lawrence White. And I don't want to be presumptuous enough to count him as a friend, but him and I have communicated quite a bit over the last year or so. And I will tell you, you guys would have been far better off had you booked him to speak this morning. I just want you to know that. All right, he is absolutely phenomenal. And a lot of the stuff that you're going to hear from me here this morning is going to be uh, themes you would hear that are similar to uh, what he is talking about all over the country at American Renewal Project meetings. Because this really is, this really is the cornerstone of any civilization. Ronald Reagan used to say, you know, it really doesn't matter uh, what other God-given rights you have. If you don't have the right to life, it's kind of a moot point. If I'm not alive, it doesn't really matter, does it? If I have a right to free speech, a right to conscience, a, a right to worship God, it doesn't really matter if I'm dead. And I can tell you as somebody, you know, you're going to have speakers here this weekend, and you had them last night, that are theologically trained. I'm, I'm here as a specialist, if you will. I, I'm, I'm the guy that after you theologically train him, you send him out into the field. And we have a platform that allows me to write for USA Today, Politico, Town Hall, Breitbart, some of the biggest media outlets in the country. Soon we're going to announce I'm going to become a columnist for the Washington Times. That's one of the biggest conservative media outlets in the United States. And I say that so that you can understand that what I'm going to tell you here is I'm ref this morning is I'm going to reflect back to you what the culture is thinking about why you are all assembled here this morning. Because ultimately we can talk about this as a theoretical exercise. But I think we're all here because we don't want to have to discuss this for another 40 years, do we? Do we want to have another 40 years of banquets? Do we want to have another 40 years of fundraisers? Or do we once and for all want to win the fight for life in America? And, and I also come from a generation that is the first born generation in America. I just turned 40, just like Roe versus Wade did. So I, I come from a generation that is the first-born generation in America to survive the Kermit Gosnell industry. Case in point, I'll tell you a little story. It's Thanksgiving weekend, 1972. Young girl here in Des Moines, Iowa, is 14 years old. And she finds out she's pregnant from her high school senior sweetheart. She's not really sure what to do. Several of her friends are pregnant. They're not sure what to do either. They're growing up in a poor side of town here called this, what used to be called the South Side Bottoms. Some of you may be old enough to remember that if you're from Des Moines. It doesn't really exist anymore. They've kind of paved over it now. It's part of the renovations of Sec Taylor, now Principal Park. A lot of those neighborhoods are gone. And come January, there's a landmark Supreme Court opinion called Roe versus Wade. And now she has options. She doesn't want to go to some back alley butcher. Now she's not sure what to do. A couple of her friends get abortions. 
She's right at that original first trimester cutoff date from Roe versus Wade. She decides, despite the fact she lives with a single mom who's twice divorced, that's a tough life in 2013, try that life in 1973. She lives with a single mom, twice divorced. She decides she's going to have that child. And at 11.59 a.m. on July 28, 1973, this now 15-year-old girl has a son over at Iowa Lutheran Hospital. His name is Steve. That's me. You can applaud that. Although I was there, my mom said I didn't do any of the work, so don't clap for me, okay? <laughs> um, tell you another story. Far more idyllic time. The 1950s, when we all want to go back there. Except there's a young girl in rural Michigan who finds herself pregnant. She's 15 years old. Pregnant in horrific circumstances. Those ex exceptions some of our pro-life politicians say it's okay to kill. And might I tell you, if you listen to nothing else I say here today, there is no such thing as pro-life with exceptions. It doesn't exist. If you're pro-life with exceptions, you're just pro-choice with fewer choices. That's really what that is. And if you think I'm wrong, okay. How about we put forth a pro-life bill that will save every kid but those born to Muslims. They're only 0.7% of the population. In fact, there are more kids conceived in rape and incest in America, about 1%, than the total population of Muslims in America, 0.7%. So we make rape and incest exceptions all the time and say those kids don't matter. So why don't we just put forth pro-life bills that say, hey, if you're a Muslim, you can abort your kid if you want. We'll let you kill it. Why wouldn't we do that? Why isn't that the same thing? Better yet, how about Hindus? There's even fewer Hindus than Muslims. Why don't we just say it's an exception? We can kill those kids. How about Jews? That, in fact, there's even a historical precedent for that. Only about 2.7% of the American population is Jewish. Why don't we just say we'll put an exception forth for them? I mean, why, why, why make exceptions for kids conceived in rape and incest? And if, they're not, if they don't matter, then why do the Jewish, Hindu, or Muslim kids matter? I went home one night and I said to my wife, honey, I'm going to be pro-marriage fidelity with exceptions. <laughs> yeah, that's not quite the reaction I got, by the way. <laughs> but I said, listen, why should I deny every available woman in America all that I have to offer? <laughs> Haven't you read Acts 2? They shared everything. I told her, it's just going to be 1% Three-hour block on a Thursday night, one time a year. You give me a hall pass, I get to be unfaithful. Deal? Next sound I heard was the sharpening of knives. I don't think that was a good <laughs> sign. And I bring that up because that little girl I told you about in Michigan, she's pregnant in horrific circumstances. I've got people in my family who are names, who are those exceptions. Some of them are my, one of them's my own children those exceptions. And this 15-year-old girl doesn't have Planned Parenthood in Michigan to help make abortion safe, legal, and rare. So her parents, embarrassed, take her to a back alley abortionist on two different occasions. The first time, he's drunk, so they don't trust him. The second time, he decides, because, you know, back alley abortionists have integrity, even they have lines they won't cross, apparently. He says, listen, this, this baby's too far along. I won't abort it. So they send her away on an extended vacation to have her child. They give that child up to Bethany Christian Services for adoption. Young couple comes in. Their last name is Burgess. He's just back from World War II. He just finished med school at the University of Michigan. He's got a promising career in medicine, but they can't have any children the old-fashioned way. So they're looking to adopt. So they see this young girl. They adopt her. They name her Mary. Now, of course, after they adopt this girl, they have five other children the old-fashioned way, right? <laughs> Seemingly, how many stories like that have you heard? 
So they name this girl Mary. She grows up, meets a young man in the 101st Airborne by the name of Robert Ramsey. They end up having one child. Her name is Amy. That is my wife. So you'll forgive me if this isn't just a theoretical exercise to me. I'll debate philosophy with anyone in this room. It's what I am trained in at a very high level. Now, if you want to debate what's under the hood of your car, I'm not your guy, okay? <laughs> in fact, I'm calling you to change my oil. I grew up with a very abusive stepfather, tried to teach me how to change my own oil once when I was a teenager. And he looked at me and he said, what are you going to do when I'm not around to do this for you? And I thought, you know, I've got a really snappy comeback here, but is it worth the beating I will receive if I drop this? <laughs> and in about three seconds, I thought, yeah, I think it is. So I looked at him and I said, well, you know, Dad, when I'm old enough, I'm going to make enough money, I'm going to pay men like you to do this for me. <laughs> that was his reaction, and then I got beat. But that's okay, because I don't remember the beating, but I do remember the look on his face when I got that line in on him, <laughs> right? But, but if you want to debate philosophy, theology... Or college football, I'm really good at that, all right? So I'll debate philosophy with you on this all that you want, but understand, for me, this is not a theoretical or a philosophical exercise, ladies and gentlemen. These are souls. These are human beings made in the image of God. Each of them has a name and a purpose. There are no exceptions. We serve a Lord who would leave 99 behind to find the one lost sheep. There are no exceptions. I spoke to a group of pastors once at a seminary, and I asked them, raise your hand if you'd like, when you're done with your ministerial career, when you're done, there's 110 people at your church. Raise your hand. No hands went up. And I said, that's funny. Christ walked his ministry every day for three and a half years, interacted with his entire nation of people. When he was done, he had a church of about 110 people hiding in an upper room, hoping to avoid persecution. Those 110 people, they changed the world. There are no exceptions. There are no exceptions to God's plan or purpose. We have to understand that. And the reason we have to understand that is because now I'm going to tell you why. 40 years later, we're still having this debate. But instead of telling you, I want to show you. Because, you know, there's a lot of polling data out there. Let me tell you, I consult for a living. I politically consult for a living. It's what I do on the side. I do it for national organizations, candidates. I do research data analysis. So a lot of the stuff you hear on the radio, my show prep, I just did it for other people and brought it with me on the air. So I can tell you all you want to know about polls and what they really say. And we love looking at these polls that show more Americans are pro-life than ever before. And, more, and fewer Americans label themselves as pro-choice than ever before. But I'm going to suggest to you, most people don't know what those things mean. They don't. They think killing a child is icky. But thinking it's icky is not the same thing as thinking it's wrong. There's all kinds of people that think it's icky for two dudes to get married. But they don't think it's wrong. And they laugh at the two dudes who are married on Modern Family every week. Oh, they think it's icky for them. Not something that doesn't float my boat. But who am I to judge somebody else? And you know the reason why? Recently, my home state and 11 others was extensively polled on the life issue by an organization I consult with and work with. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars done to poll where do Iowans sit on the life issue? What do they really think? When we get beyond the slogans and the cliches, what do they really think? And this was done in, 11, in 10 other states, Georgia, Michigan, it was done in 11 states, to find out how pro-life is America really. And you know what the results showed? I know, because I was one of the people they asked to analyze this results for, these results for them. You know what they showed? Mass confusion the double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. We are all over the place. You guys gave totally different answers to the questions depending on how the question was asked. If the question was asked, what's best for the woman? Then it's kill with impunity. 
Or as Dr. Lawrence White would say, the killing continues. If the emphasis is on what's best for the mom, most of you don't care if you kill that thing after it's alive. Funny thing is, though, if the emphasis is on what's best for the child, guess what? You're staunchly pro-life. The whole point of emphasis is on whether or not that's a person inside that woman. What is that? And see, most people have not been challenged. Especially, now, as you, the younger you go, the more pro-life you are. But you know why they're pro-life? Because they recognize that it would have been legal for their parents to kill them and not legal for their grandparents to kill their parents. They don't really, though, know what it really means. And so they're glad they're alive. That's why they're pro-life. I'll use another Ronald Reaganism. He once pointed out everybody that's ever been pro-abortion is already born. Anybody notice that? Okay. So, I mean, they're glad that they're still alive, but they don't know that they should step in and legally protect another kid. Here's how confused we are. I'll give you an example. Young lady's pregnant. She's on her way to a Planned Parenthood almost anywhere in America. Goes past the stoplight, sees the sign. Next turn, she's got her turn signal on. Next turn is into the parking lot, except what she doesn't see is a drunk driver. Sideswipes her, kills her and her unborn child. Guess what? He's on the hook for two vehicular homicides. Yet, with her turn signal on, if she had finished the turn safely and pulled into the Planned Parenthood, walked out of her car safely, and killed the child, no one says a word. Don't tell me we're winning when that's the case. That's not true. Now, the other side has lost momentum as a new generation, my generation, the one behind me, realizes, you know, we have people that would be in our generation that aren't here because we've killed them. But that realization is not the same as understanding why that is the case. For too long, we have nibbled around the margins of this fight. The other side is making a profound philosophical statement to win hearts and minds. We're trying to regulate abortuaries. Now, those are two totally different things. And I can tell you in the postmodern age that your children and grandchildren are currently growing up in, whoever has the most powerful story wins. Not whoever has the most objective truth on their side, because this day and age rejects the idea that objective truth even exists. Whoever has the most powerful story wins. And you tell me what's the most powerful story. I impose my values on you, or a woman should have the right to do whatever she wants to do with her own body. What's the more powerful story? And you know what's funny is we all would agree a woman should have the right to do whatever she wants to do with her own body, provided it doesn't hurt somebody else. And see, that's the question here, isn't it? Is that a somebody else? But I want to let you watch something for about five minutes. This is from the Media Research Center, Brent Bozell, longtime pro-life activist, sent one of his cameras and one of his personalities to a college campus. And he wanted to find out if he could get college students to sign up, forget this now, fourth trimester abortions. Boy, you can't slip anything past kids these days, can you? <laughs> no one bothers to say, I'm sorry, how do you have a fourth of a try? Anybody? <laughs> fourth trimester abortions. Will you sign up? Listen to their answers. Zany hijinks ensue. Listen to this. Order the latest blockbuster from Brent Bozell and Tim Graham, Collusion, How the Media Stole the 2012 Election and How to Stop Them from Doing It in 2016. Available in hardcover. A must-read for every true conservative. Order your copy now at mediacollusion.com. Hey everybody, I'm Dan Joseph. Recently there's been a lot of talk about abortion laws in this country with new laws being passed in Texas. It's got a lot of the pro-choice people up in arms. I came out to a college campus and I'm going to find out if people are willing to sign my petition to legalize fourth trimester abortion. Now if you don't know what fourth trimester is, that's, that's after the baby is already born. Yeah. Currently fourth trimester abortions are legal in all 50 states. We want to make them legal so uh, women have the choice 
Um, we feel that it's a woman's body. Take it all. We're, we're just trying to sign, get people to sign a petition to, uh, to legalize fourth trimester abortion. Currently, fourth trimester abortion is illegal in all 50 states. And, and Does it cause harm to the child? What? Does it cause harm to the child? Well, the child, I mean, wouldn't be there anymore. It's, okay. it's abortion. I mean, you know, the child's gone. I think a lot of conservatives just want to see women in the kitchen, not, not doing other things. And I'm personally, my girlfriend can't cook, so, <laughs> you know, that would suck for me. Isn't the reason why they don't do it is because it's technically, like, it will hurt the child or like... Well, I, I don't know, frankly, the physical, so I mean, but you know, I don't think a woman should be punished with a, an unwanted child. Sign a petition to legalize fourth trimester abortion. It's currently uh, illegal in all 50 states, and we believe that a, a woman shouldn't suffer uh, because of an unwanted post-pregnancy. I don't think it's right to tell women what to do. Oh, if you could email there, too. Cool. Cool. You need some help? You want me to hold your cigarette for you? I got it all. Are you sure? I yes. You're only 15? Uh, eh, what the hell, you know? I'm not supposed to, but you would really be helping us out. See, fourth trimester abortion is illegal. And, and you, you know, you're old enough to, to get pregnant, right? Probably. Nah, I think you should decide in the first trimester, you know? It's like, I don't consider that to be a person, you know what I mean? Why do you, why do you hate women, man? <laughs> we believe it's a child and a choice. Can you, can you help us out today? All right, thank you so I do much. Planned Parenthood, I do everything. Oh, you do? Well, we love Planned Parenthood. Fourth trimester, that's what, eight? 40, 40 weeks. 40 weeks? So, yeah. Can you help us out today? We believe it's a woman's right to choose. And men in Washington saying, you do not get to make the rules about what a woman can do with her body and with her baby. Okay. Well, down with that? I'm down. All right, cool. What exactly is illegal? Uh, fourth trimester abortion. It's illegal everywhere. Okay, and what exactly is fourth? that? That's, that would be after the third trimester. Uh, after the ninth month of pregnancy. Oh, okay. After the ninth month? After the ninth month. Yeah, sorry. I no? I think I'm up for that. All right. Yeah, I just had a baby three months ago. Oh, you did? Congratulations. Yeah. That's great. Well, he would be very, very proud of you, I think, signing this. Right. right. The trimester would be when the baby's already born. Right, well, well, yeah, I mean, technically that's true, but what if the baby's, like, you know, I don't know, annoying or cries a lot? <laughs> I'm not signing that, man. Support a woman's right to choose? What? Oh. Could I have some of your drink? All right. I say it's not even a life until it you know, can pay taxes. Right. Excuse me, sir. Will you sign this petition? I'm not even going to tell you what's on it. Just sign it. It's, it's, it's cool. Don't worry. Don't, don't, even, don't even read it. It's, it's, not, it's fine. Just sign it. We have this uh, Bible discussion up in the second floor. Uh, oh, of the JC. really? Uh, it's going to be at two thirty today. But we have them like three days a week. Is it something you're interested in? Hey, you know, I don't, I don't really know much about the Bible. Uh, you know, I'm not very religious. Gotcha. But um, you know, do you think they'd sign my petition? <laughs> um, I want to say that generally no. Yeah. You like women? Uh, I like men, but oh, that's right. well, that's good. I teach at this um, three-week program called EIP. Oh, you're a teacher? Is that a menthol? Mm-hmm. You can tell. Yeah, I can tell. Say hi to everybody at Planned Parenthood for me the next time you see them. <laughs> they probably tell them they tell them uh, Carlos said hi. Carlos. Carlos Danger. All right. <laughs> Carlos Danger. Carlos Danger. Really? What's your name? That's not even made up. No. <laughs> Great. Thank you so You're much. Welcome. Have a good day. Thank you. So it's it's an abortion thing, you know. No big deal. Okay. Thanks, man. Good luck. Good luck to you. So I was out here for uh, almost exactly an hour. I ended up getting about 14 signatures. That's, that's a lot for summer when there are not as many people on campus. Um, there were a few people caught on to what I was trying to do. Um, but if you are a pro-choice activist, you have to be pretty happy about this many people supporting this cause. Keep your... It's funny till you realize Soylent Green is people. Those are human beings we're talking about killing. How uninformed? The reference to Carlos Danger, you know what that is? Former New York Congressman Anthony Weiner, that was his screen name when he went trolling for chicks that he wasn't married to. He called himself Carlos Danger. That was only in the news perpetually for about three weeks. And here we are in a college campus with allegedly the smartest and most educated. I have no idea what that is. Now, might I submit to you that if you don't know when pregnancy ends, you don't know when life begins.
And if you don't know when life begins, you're not going to protect human life. See, the other side has stated a huge, their version of truth. Listen to all the cliches. Every child a wanted child. Woman has the right to do whatever she wants with her own body. Heard all these cliches a million times. How about, well, I don't think it's a life until it can pay taxes. You may think that's preposterous. We played audio on my radio program last night of a homosexual activist named Ann Savage who was at a conference recently. And they asked him, hey, because this is who you should ask how to cure what's wrong with the world, of course. He'd be number one on my list. Never. And they asked him, hey, what would help the world? And he said, population control. The reality is, outside of a few third world parts of the country, or the world, the world's not overpopulated at all. This country is actually underpopulated. We're not breeding enough out here in the West. That's true. We're being outbred all over the world, particularly in the Muslim world, but that's a whole other conference. But he said, hey, population control, and here's what we ought to do. How about abortions mandatory up to 30 years old? People laughed and they clapped. Well, because we're all utilitarians now. If, if nobody wants that life, if it has no need or no use, we're all Bolsheviks now, we're all Soviets now, each according to his needs, to each according to his abilities. Now, how has this happened despite the fact we can go out in the lobby of this church and see that every ounce of scientific evidence is on our side? We don't have to bring up the scriptures. We don't have to bring up the Bible. Which, by the way, we should. I've never understood why Christians say, well, I don't want to offend people by bringing up the Bible. Imagine a general who said, you know, I've got this weapon that just devastates my enemy every time, but it might offend him, so I won't use it. We'll just lose the war instead. What kind of general would do that? But we don't even have to do that in this argument. What are those pictures out there in the hallway? What are they? When you walked in this morning, what were you looking at? All the scientific evidence is on our side. They don't have a leg to stand on. I can take all kinds of Bible verses out of context and come up with pacifism, socialism. I can at least see why people can just distort the heck out of the Bible or human history and come up with arguments for those things. There is no argument for this. None. There's not an argument that has a leg to stand on. I was on MSNBC last year contributing as an analyst during the election. We did a panel once, the day after Richard Murdoch gave his comments in Indiana that all life is sacred, even life conceived in rape and incest. Now understand what balance looks like on MSNBC, okay? <laughs> a liberal host, three liberals, and me. That's balance. So of course, they all go around the room giving their take and all their cliches, and after they've done, spewed all of the Planned Parenthood talking points, they then say, hey, what do you think now that it's four against one? And I said to them, you know, we can debate this philosophically if you want. But before we do that, and I'm happy to do that if you would like to, but before we do that, I just have one offer I'd like to make to all of you. I want to make sure we all understand what we're really talking about here. So before we go into the lint in our navel, let's actually talk about what the, what the result, the practical result of this debate, what it really is. I've got a friend of mine, an attorney in Michigan by the name of Rebecca Kiesling. She has five children. She was conceived in a gang rape. Her mother tried to abort her twice. So as long as you guys are willing in this year of the war on women... As long as you're all willing to look into the camera on national television and say that we're okay, that Rebecca Kiesling and all of her children never have a right to live, all can die, and any of the descendants her children may have, as long as you're willing to say that and admit what the practical result of what you're arguing really is, as long as you're willing to do that, then I will debate this theoretically and philosophically with you until the cows come home. But first, let's admit what we're really talking about here. They could not change the subject fast enough. One of the panelists said, well, I really respect Steve's convictions and his opinion on this, and I just believe in a woman's right to choose, and now let's talk about why Republicans hate poor people. Okay? 
you know why they didn't want to have that debate? Because they can't win. So forgive me, you know, I've been involved. A lot of you have done, I'm sure, pro-life activism. The political activism I do is behind the scenes with the people who really make decisions. Candidates, consultants, meetings where leaders get together and try to determine who should be the Republican nominee for president, who should be this state senator, congressman. Those, I have the behind the scenes conversations. So they know a little bit about strategy, but maybe someone in this room knows more than I do. So please, someone enlighten me. How can you win an argument when you never have the argument, the other side of the argument can't win? Anybody, can you help me with that? Help me with that? How are we gonna win? How are we gonna win when we never debate the point the side you're up against doesn't wanna debate? Might there be a reason they don't want to debate that point, do you think? Might there be a reason they don't want that to come up? Might there be a reason that when I bring the Bible up in public, people will say to me, well, you know, I don't believe we ought to bring the Bible into this. Well, listen, if, if I had God against me, I wouldn't want to bring it into it either. <laughs> you know, if, if, if one side's got B-1 bombers and the other side's driving, you know, prop planes, I wouldn't want to bring the B-1 bomber into it either. So why don't we have that conversation? See, for 40 years, we have had huge victories in this fight. There are children alive today that would not be alive if it wasn't for the work of the pro-life movement. States like Mississippi only have one abortuary open in the entire state. There have been victories. We cannot deny that. And in a way, those victories almost makes it inexcusable that we don't have the ultimate victory. And the reason I believe we've not had the ultimate victory is because we argue the practice of killing children, and that's what it is, by the way. I don't know why we call it abortion. I sent a column on this just yesterday, or two days ago, to one of the publications I write for nationally. And I refer to it as what it was. We're killing children. I won't tell you it was, because I'd still like to be able to write for that publication. All right? But I said, you know, it's interesting to me that we got a bunch of liberals concerned about the Washington Redskins nickname, and I don't know how you can argue it's not a racist caricature. I don't know how you can argue the other side that it's not. But forgive me if I'm more concerned about the fact that if we're really concerned about human worth and dignity, we're killing 4,000 little children a day. Might I maybe focus on that before I worry about the logo of an NFL team? And my editor there said, great piece, but there's no way I can run that. So he told me. No way I can run that. And you know why? because the liberals can't argue against that. So why do we use their terminology? Why do we say pro-choice? Do we call serial killers pro-choice? Do we? What do we call them? Killers. Why do we call it the abortion industry? You know what an abortion sounds like? Getting my tonsils or my gallbladder out. I'm in, I'm out, slam, bam, thank you, man. Move on with the rest of my life. It's not a clinical procedure. We're killing people. What are the pictures out there in the foyer? When you go out there, what are those? They're people. People that once were alive and then are dead, which means we have killed them. So would you rather argue against somebody who's pro-choice or somebody who's killing kids? Who would you rather argue against? Who do you think is going to probably win that argument? Why do we use their terminology? Yes, it will offend people because you know we're so popular now. I mean, the good news is, we're so unpopular right now, now's the time to just really let it rip. We can't really lose anybody else at this point. You're like, we're like the pastor who's just said, you know what, man, I tried that whole megachurch program and pff, didn't pan out. I might as well go ahead and give you the gospel now. <laughs> I mean, everybody left. I might as well go Missouri Synod on you and just tell you the truth. So we, 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 the good news is we have nothing to lose. We have no popularity points. We have one political party in America who hates your guts because one of their top fundraising streams is Planned Parenthood. We have another political party in America who would not have won a national election in the last 40 years if it wasn't for the people in this room. Catholics never voted Republican until Roe versus Wade. Now the Republican Party struggles to get 50% of the Catholic vote in a good year. Evangelicals didn't even vote. You were reading Hal Lindsey books waiting to be raptured until Roe versus Wade. The Reagan Revolution, the National Republican Coalition, would not have happened if not for the pro-life voter. One of the groups that trained me in political activism is National Right to Work. They're one of the best in America, undefeated against the left. And in 
feed it against the Republican Party. You don't go for their issue. They take out sitting speakers in state legislatures in primaries if they don't support them. And one thing they taught me is in every state they go to, the first group they organize are you. Now, why would National Right to Work, op why would they organize pro-life voters? You know why? Because they, they figured out, if you guys get this right, you'll get all the rest of the issues that are right about freedom and liberty and morality as well. This is the cornerstone issue. And you're the ones that are the most likely to show up, the most likely to donate, the most likely to respond to phone calls and robocalls, the most likely to vote. And so when they want to save right to work in Iowa, my home state, they don't go to the business community. No, National Right to Work came here. They organized the pro-life vote. That's what they did. And they branched out from there. Understand there would not be a substantive victory of the Republican Party in this country for the last half century if it weren't for you. Yet they want to abandon you, like they abandoned Todd Akin, like they abandoned Richard Murdoch. They want to abandon you. So listen, we have nothing to lose. So can we finally now, actually after 40 years, let's tell the culture the truth. You're killing children. And that's what we call it on my show, and that's what I refer to it and what I write. We're killing children. If you want people to think we're killing children to raise awareness of the issue, I communicate for a living, but I think, and I think I got this one right. If you want people to think we're killing children, guess what? We should probably call it killing children. That's probably what we ought to call it. So there is a way, I think, to win. But to win, we have to stop arguing the practice of killing kids. Meaning, you can kill a kid if you don't use this particular gas. A lot of us think the uh, partial birth abortion ban was a win. You ever read Carhartt versus Gonzalez? You ever read that court opinion? Have you read it? I have. Have you? Do you know what Carhartt versus Gonzalez is? It's a how-to manual. Well, you can kill the kid this way, just not this way. Basically, here's what we did. And this is why Dr. Dobson himself at Focus and the Family admitted at the time, really, this was a great effort in raising awareness about the issue, but we didn't really save any kids. He admitted it. Why? Because if you look at the Supreme Court opinion, all it did was say, I'll tell you what, you can keep the gas chambers open provided you use a different gas than the one you were using before. That's what it said. And, here, and not only that, it went a step further and said, here's the gas you can use instead to kill those folks. So we need to attack the premise of killing children, not the practice of it. And if we don't, we're going to sit here 40 years from now and lament another 56 million lost souls. So what does that look like? You know, a lot of times your enemy will tell you what your most effective tool is. I want to take you back to the original Roe versus Wade hearing itself. And I want you to listen to the testimony. You heard one young man in that MRC video say what? Well, I'm okay with first trimester abortions because I don't think it's a person. I don't think it's a person. Let's take you back. To Roe versus Wade at the U.S. Supreme Court, actual audio of the hearing itself. I want you to listen to this. Stand number 7018, Roe against Wade. You would agree, I suppose, that one of the important factors that has to be considered in this case is what rights, if any, does the unborn fetus have? That's correct. Yes. And the basic constitutional question initially is whether or not an unborn fetus is a person, yes. isn't it? That's yes. critical to this case. Yes, sir. it is. If it were established that an unborn fetus is a person within the protection of the 14th Amendment, you would have almost an impossible case here. Would I not? would have a very difficult case. Certainly would. Could Texas constitutionally, in your view, uh, declare that by statute that... Uh, Fetus is a person for all constitutional purposes. The state could obviously adopt that kind of statute, and then the question would have to be adjudicated. If it were established that an unborn fetus is a person within the protection of the 14th Amendment, you would have almost an impossible case. It's an impossible case. It's an impossible case. It's an impossible case. Why the 14th Amendment? What does the 14th Amendment say? Echoing the words of the 5th Amendment to the Constitution, it says, No person shall be denied life or liberty without due process of law. No person. The word person is found throughout your founding documents. 
letter from a Birmingham jail, one of the greatest rhetorical arguments written in the 20th century, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. responding to ministers who are telling him as he sits in a Birmingham jail cell, you need to tone down your fight for civil rights. Work the process. If I hear one more time from a politician, you've got to work the process, I'm going to throw up in my mouth. I'm tired of hearing it. They told that to Martin Luther King Jr. too. Work the process. Let the process play itself out. Get lynched a little bit less. Work the process. And he wrote a letter back to him from that jail cell, responding to their pleas for moderation and reason. And he said, quoting from Augustine, any human law or code that violates God's law is no law at all, and we have a moral obligation as Christians to oppose it, he says. And then he goes a step further and he says, how do we know whether or not it violates God's law? Beyond, is it unbiblical? He says this very interesting turn of phrase. He says, any human law or code that undermines the dignity of the human person is an unjust law or code. And we have a duty and an obligation as ministers of the gospel to oppose this. Well, you tell me, what undermines human worth or dignity more than killing the most innocent among us, the most defenseless among us? What does? All on the altar of child sacrifice for the purposes of our own convenience. Do you want to stop this once and for all? People tell me all the time, I need to be more pragmatic. I love it when people say, I don't care about winning. Good Lord. All I care about is winning. I'm obsessed with it. Watch me make my kids cry in the backyard when they can't beat me at wiffle ball. Watch me go for the throat with chutes and ladders and candy land. (laughs) I hate losing. I'm obsessed with it. We've got a board, a map of the United States up in my office. And we've got little uh, little uh, pins we put in there whenever we land an affiliate. If I go in there, man, and there's not been a pin landing in there for two or three days, or or even a week, ask my staff. I'm impossible to deal with. I love winning. I'm obsessed with it. It's my addiction. I need a lot of accountability in my life not to let it become self-destructive. I'm giving you the path to winning. Nothing's more pragmatic than getting on the side of the only undefeated being in the history of this universe. Tell me what is more pragmatic than that. Would you like to be on the side of pagan justices or the side of Almighty God? Which side do you think is more pragmatic to be on? Last I checked, not even the grave could hold him. He's undefeated. So if we want to protect his children, we should actually protect his children. Is it a person or not? When is it a person? What is a person? If it's not a person, then there's a lot of other places we could be this morning. I could be back in sports talk radio. I'd have a lot more friends, let me tell you. A lot more. I never thought I could alienate more people than Hawkeye fans. Then I got into politics. Good Lord. (laughs) And that's just the Republicans who don't like me. What do you think the other side thinks? All right. I mean, we'd all have a lot more friends. Life would be a lot more fun. Facebook would be a lot more interesting. The only reason we're here, is there another reason we're here other than these are people? Is there another reason we're here? Because this is just so much fun, right? Roll out the barrel. The only reason we're here is because these are people. So if that's the reason we're here, and that's the only justification for why we're telling a woman you can't do what you want to do with your own body because it's not your body, then shouldn't all of the arguments we make begin and end there? When the Constitution says no person shall be denied life, liberty, or property without due process of law, then shouldn't all of our arguments, shouldn't every argument, everything we do, start and end there? These are persons. That's what they are. When when the Word of God says every one of us, every person is created in the image of God. You know, the book of Genesis asserts a truth that is unique in all of the history of human religion. It is the only time in any human religion that the creation of men and women are both acknowledged equally. Happens in no other religious text in the history of this planet. 
Male and female, he created them equal. That's never said anywhere. That's a radical statement on half the planet in the 21st century. What do you think it was? How radical it was when Moses wrote those words, originally in the Pentateuch. All of the truth is on our side. All of the science is on our side. Someone please tell me. On behalf of the 4,000 children we're going to kill today, why don't we try to win? This isn't tilting at windmills. It's the only argument we have. I argue for a living. I am trained to argue my side and the other side. That's how I'm trained. So I do this for a living. I anticipate other people's arguments to my own before I bring my own argument. I have to, otherwise I'm going to get gunned down on national TV. But for the life of me, I have no idea what other argument we have. I really don't, other than what's up there. Here you have the Supreme Court saying, hey, is that a person or not? So why don't we make that argument? Now me, I'm a radical. Uh, to me, you know, I, I wouldn't, if I was your governor in any state in the country, we wouldn't be killing kids. And I'd tell the feds, call in the National Guard, oh wait, I control them, tough luck. Because in my state, we don't do stuff God says is wrong. And I answer to him, I took an oath of office to him and not to you. Now that's how I roll. I get that I'm a little more radical than a lot of other people are. Some of you think that we can't do anything until the Supreme Court says so. I don't agree with that. You know, I believe that we have the will of the people here and no judge or no soldiers ever died for a court opinion. But if that's the thought process you come out of, okay. If you think we can't do anything without overturning Roe versus Wade, then you tell me what other grounds would we have to get the court to consider overturning it? What other grounds would we have? What other grounds? Mortuaries are unsafe. Okay, we'll just clean them up then. 4,000 a day is just too much. Okay, we'll just have a salary cap then. 1,500, okay? What other argument? Tell me, please, someone tell me what other argument we have. Because I don't think we have another argument. So if you believe that we just sit here and put up and try to save as many as we can and put up with this evil, this just intrinsic evil in our country, we can't possibly ask God to bless when we kill our own children. So if you think we can't do anything until the court steps in, fine. Then you've got to beg a question that gets the court to consider stepping in. The only question that would cause the court to reconsider its position is, are these people? We should be passing personhood initiatives all over the country and every state in the union to force this issue on the courts. And then we should take the pictures that you have out in your hallway we should get lawyers that don't want to argue precedent from pagans. No. Lawyers who will stand up and say, hey, hey, uh, uh, Judge, Judge Sotomayor, I got, I got something here for you. Here's this picture. Here's, my, here's what I'm thinking. You tell me what this is. Thanks. That's your case. What is that? And yeah, you might lose the first time. We lost at Dred Scott, too. But you make them tell the country, despite what your eyes see, those aren't tr children. Dred Scott mobilized the abolitionist movement to finish the job. To have a court literally say, that's not a person, that's property. Yes, it can act, think, speak, behave like any other human person, but it's still property. That galvanized the abolitionist movement. Make them say it. Because the next time you bring it before them, they won't say it again. That's the whole argument. When I was in a, the, the tummy of a 14-year-old girl, was I a person or not? Was I? When my mother-in-law was in the tummy of a 15-year-old girl, was she a person or not? When Noah, my son, was in the tummy of my wife, almost costing her her life, an emergency C-section that almost put her in a coma, that we weren't sure she was going to wake up from. Was Noah a person or not? Was he? Those 4,000 kids we killed yesterday and the day before that and the day before that and the 4,000 kids we're going to kill today and tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. Are those people? Are they? Then you better start telling people that's what they are. That's the argument you need to make. You cannot 
win any other way. And if you think I'm wrong, I've got 40 years of history backing me up on this. And this is why, as Dr. Lawrence White would say, the killing continues. We don't make that argument. Thank you for letting me come here this morning. I appreciate it. God bless you.